In this video, we're going to explore some of the ancient pottery of the northern southwest. In season four, I focused on the southern southwest. I looked at seven distinct cultural groups, and I picked out seven different pots that I recreated during that season. In season five, I'm going to do the same thing with the northern southwest. We're going to take a virtual tour of the northern southwest. We're going to look at seven different cultural groups that lived up there, and I'm going to pick seven different pots that I'm going to replicate this season. If you want to join in, you're welcome to make some of these pots and upload them to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge, and I will share all the submissions here on this channel when we're all done. So to start with, let's talk about what the Colorado Plateau is. The Colorado Plateau is a huge plateau that encompasses a vast region of the northern southwestern United States. It sits right over what's known as the Four Corners area. That is where the four states of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah come together. The plateau is characterized by these sedimentary deposits, these layers of sandstone and shale that have made this landscape very unique. In fact, many of the features we think of when we think of the Colorado Plateau are related to that sandstone. Places like the Grand Canyon, Zion National Park, Canyon de Chelly National Monument. These places and their distinct look is all based on those layers of sandstone that have eroded. And so just as this sedimentary deposit has influenced the unique landscape that we see in the Colorado Plateau, it has also influenced the cultures and the pottery that developed there. The prehistoric culture of the Colorado Plateau is almost entirely, although not completely, what used to be called Anazazi and what is today known as Ancestral Puebloan. But because it's such a large culture over a large area, archeologists further divide them into smaller subgroups. So there's Cayenta and Cibola and Chaco and different regions within that. So as I travel around the Colorado Plateau today, I'm gonna to be talking about these different subgroups and the unique pottery they made. So let's get started on our tour of the Colorado Plateau. Our first stop is the Q Ranch, which lies just south of the southern edge of the plateau, but has an important historic connection to the pottery made on the plateau. So let me take you now to our correspondent who is already at the Q Ranch. So then the bartender says, oh, wait, I'm on. Sorry about that. I'm here at the Q Ranch, which is a working cattle ranch, but also is built on the site of an ancient prehistoric Pueblo. Q Ranch Pueblo was made by immigrants from the Colorado Plateau in the mid 1200s. And although it's not on the Colorado Plateau, an interesting thing occurs here with the pottery. There's a lot of pottery found in the ruins here at Q Ranch, but almost all of the decorated pottery is not made here. We find that the plain ware was made here on site, but the decorated ware was all imported from on the Colorado Plateau. So there was an important cultural connection from those folks living on the plateau. The types of decorated pottery we find most abundantly here are White Mountain Redwares and Salado Polychromes. Both of these types originated up near Sholo, Arizona, far to the northeast of here. So the first pot that we're gonna make this season to represent the Colorado Plateau is this Pinto Polychrome Bowl, which was found here at Q Ranch Pueblo, but was not made here, was actually imported from the Colorado Plateau. Pinto Polychrome was the first of the Salado Polychrome types. And although we associate Salado Polychromes with the Southern Southwest, a lot of people don't know that Salado Polychromes actually originated on the Colorado Plateau, on the very Southern edge there in the Sholo area, using designs that were native to the Colorado Plateau, using even materials that came from the Colorado Plateau in the case of the White Slip. Once this type was established here in this area and caught on, it quickly spread far to the South and East, almost as far south as the Mexican border and as far east as New Mexico. So that's the pottery we're going to be making from Q Ranch here at the southern edge of the Colorado Plateau. Let me take you now to our correspondent who is standing by in Sholo, Arizona. I'm coming to you today from Sholo, Arizona. I'll have to be brief because I'm standing in the street and I don't want to get run over. On second thought, those cars don't seem to be moving very fast. I think I have time. Sholo, Arizona, on the southern edge of the Colorado Plateau, was a hotbed for pottery production in the 1300s. You see, in the late 1200s, a lot of the villages in this area were abandoned, and people coalesced into a few large, plaza-oriented pueblos. One of those large pueblos was right here where the city of Sholo is today. All this cultural coalescence that took place in the late 1200s caused an artistic renaissance to take place in the early 1300s, as different people came together and brought together different ideas. 
Some of the things that came out of that renaissance were some beautiful new pottery types, glaze painted white mountain redwares and salado polychromes. So the pot I've selected to represent this region for the ancient pottery challenge this season is this beautiful Sholo polychrome jar. Now let's move further east into the Zuni region where we'll meet the first of several black on white pottery types we'll be looking at today. Hello from the Cibola region of West Central New Mexico. Cibola is the term archaeologists use to refer to this sub-region within ancestral Puebloan culture. It's set apart by unique pottery styles and architectural styles and things like that. Let's talk for a minute about why there's so much black and white pottery here on the Colorado Plateau. Part of it is cultural because once your culture has a history of making black on white pottery, you're more inclined to make more black and white pottery. It's your tradition. But a lot of it is based on the geology. And that is because of these layers of sandstone that exist on the Colorado Plateau. So the hill you can see behind me here today is made up of layers and layers of sandstone and shale. And in those layers, there's layers of clay, really good marine clay. But because they were laid down in ancient seabeds or estuaries, they tend to be fairly light colored clays, grays and whites. And so these colors of clay naturally lend themselves to white pottery. Now all of these clays tend to have small amounts of iron and other minerals in them. And so in an oxidation fire, they'll fire kind of a buff or a cream color. And so in order to get the whitest whites, you have to fire them in a reduction atmosphere. So as pottery technology evolved in this area, it tended to go towards these smothered reduction firings because that produces the whitest whites. And that also helps you turn iron paint, which is easy to make, into reduced black designs. So you get a lot of contrast, makes a real stunning pot, as you can see by these pictures. And so the Cibola region, it's no surprise, is known for their black on white pottery. But unlike a lot of other areas in the ancestral Pueblo and homeland, the Cibola region is known for mineral painted black and white potteries, whereas some of the other black and white pottery we're going to look at today are painted with organic paint. So the Cibola potter started producing black on white pottery in about 500 AD, so pretty early on because pottery technology probably didn't even arrive here until maybe 100, 200 years before that. And like anywhere, pottery evolves, right? It starts out with really rudimentary designs and gets more and more elaborate. So the pot we're going to be looking at today is Tularosa black on white, which is really the ultimate, was really the highest point of evolution for Cibola whiteware. This was right before they stopped making black on white pottery. Now, if you look at it, they started making it in 500. They made black and white pottery and it continued to evolve up into the 1300s. So over 700 years of pottery evolution in black and white pottery before they stopped. So, you know, why did they stop making black and white pottery? Redware. The redwares we looked at in the last area when we were down in Sholo, redwares became so popular here that they actually outstripped black and whites and people stopped making them for a period of time. And that's really what happened. So about 1325, that's the end of black and white pottery here in this area. And Tularosa black and white was made right up until about 1325 when black and white pottery stopped being made. This season, this is the pot I'm going to be trying to reproduce. I'm going to try to do it right. The last Tularosa pot I made on this channel, first of all, it broke. But second of all, it was painted with manganese-based paint. So it wasn't really authentic because the Cibola stuff was actually painted with red iron oxide, as I said. And so this time we're going to do it right. We're going to paint it with red iron oxide. We're going to try to reduction fire it and get it done right. Okay, so that's it for the Cibola region. Let's move north now to Chaco Canyon and talk about Chaco black on white pottery. Welcome to Chaco Culture National Historic Park. This is a place where everyone who's interested in southwestern prehistory should take the time to visit. Unfortunately, the bad part is there are no artifacts on display here. So if you want to come look at the architecture, great. But if you want to look at Chaco artifacts, specifically pottery, you won't find any here. The Park Service has some of them in a facility in Albuquerque, and most of the artifacts that came out of Chaco Canyon are in East Coast institutions, Washington, D.C., and Boston, and places like this. Really, a long ways to go for any local scholars who want to look at that stuff. In early times, Chaco pottery was very similar to Cibola pottery. In fact, they're often grouped together by archaeologists because of the similarities. But the most famous pottery from Chaco are the cylinder jars. So only something like 200 of these cylinder jars have ever been discovered anywhere in the Southwest. And like most of them, like three quarters of them, came from one room at Pueblo Benito here in Chaco Canyon. And so they're really unusual just for that reason alone. But not long ago, they did some studies on these jars, residue analysis, to see if they could find out what they were used for. 
And what they found was residue of chocolate in these jars. So we know that they were drinking chocolate from these big cylinder jars here in Chaco Canyon. The nearest place that chocolate would have grown is over a thousand miles away down in Mexico. So that's really something, says a lot about what was going on here in those days. So the pot I've chosen to reproduce for the Chaco area is one of these cylinder jars. Now technologically, it's very similar to Cibola pottery. It's made with a gray clay, it's got a white slip, and then it's painted with red iron oxide paint that is then fired in a reduction atmosphere. So again, another chance to kind of try out that reduction firing process. All right, so that's what I have to say about Chaco. Now we're gonna take you on up to Mesa Verde to talk to our correspondent who's already there. Mesa Verde is by far the most visited ruin in the Southwest. It's probably the most visited ruin in North America, north of Mexico. And again, like Chaco, the focus is on the architecture. But the ancient Mesa Verdeans made some phenomenal pottery. Mesa Verde black on white pottery is really some of the finest black on white pottery made in the ancient Southwest. And it was made right up until this region was abandoned around 1300 AD. Mesa Verde black on white pottery is different from Chaco and Cibola black on white in that it used organic paint. But similarly, it's made from a gray body clay with a white slip. In this case, it has to be that special smectite slip that will hold organic paint. Same as we do with Salado Polychrome. And then organic paint is painted on top of that, probably with Rocky Mountain bee plant. Although archeologically, we have no evidence what they were using for their organic paint in this region. And then it's fired in a big smothered trench kiln. So the real challenge with this pottery type for me is the smothering part, because I've never done a smothered organic paint firing before. I've watched them at the kiln conference, but this will be my first opportunity to kind of get my hands dirty trying it out. And so the pot I've chosen to make to represent the Mesa Verde region is a mug because that's a really unique form that they made a lot of in Mesa Verde. So I've picked this really nice Mesa Verde black on white mug to replicate this season. And now to continue our counterclockwise motion around the Colorado Plateau, we're gonna go south and west and look at the Cayenta region. The ancient Cayenta lived in a region of north central Arizona. If you ever get a chance to visit Navajo National Monument, they have cliff dwellings here that rival those at Mesa Verde, although they're less well known. But once again, the emphasis isn't on the architecture here, it's on the pottery. The Cayenta made an organic painted black on white pottery very similar to their Mesa Verde neighbors. But what we're really interested in is their polychrome. They had some beautiful redware pottery. And so the pot I've selected this time is this Tusayan polychrome bowl. And it's very distinctive because people in neighboring areas didn't make pottery like this. Very unique to the Cayenta area. So for our last stop, we're gonna move further south down by Flagstaff for the last of these seven pottery types here on the Colorado Plateau. For the Flagstaff region, we're gonna travel back in time a little bit. So most of the pottery types we've looked at in this tour of the Colorado Plateau were made in that 1250 to 1300 time period because that's really the apex in the evolution of these pottery types. So right around 1300, a lot of cultural change happened across the plateau. You have either people changing the way they made pottery entirely or completely abandoning the region. And so that's kind of the point, 1250 to 1300, when a lot of these pottery types reached the height of the evolution of that pottery type. And so as I went through and selected those seven types, I tended to pick types that were from, you know, the later periods, the time when they kind of reached the apex of their evolution. So for the Flagstaff region, I'm going to travel back a little bit. I picked a type called Sosi Black on White, which was made up until about 1200 before that evolved into something else. So this one might seem a little bit more primitive, a little less evolved than some of the others, but it's a beautiful type. And it's this pitcher right here. A really beautiful little pitcher. And I think the design is going to be really challenging. Now this is a Tusayan whiteware type. So this is one of those types of whiteware that was made by the ancestral Hopi, the Cayenta and Tusayan people in the western portion of the Colorado Plateau. So this is made very similar to the Mesa Verde style, organic painted black on white. So that wraps up our tour of the Colorado Plateau and the seven types of pottery. Now let me send you back to Andy in Tucson so he can cover the rules of the Ancient Pottery Challenge this season. Okay, so last year I made these seven pots from the Southern Southwest. I replicated them all as closely to the original as I could, trying to use the same native clays, the same traditional methods of forming and firing. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna do this year. I'm gonna go out and try to make these as close to the original, as close to replica as possible. Now, what about you? It's called a challenge because the idea was that 
other people, people that watch this channel would participate, would try to do the same ones and we would compare and see how it was. I had very little participation last year and so uh, I'm at the point this year where it really doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter if people participate or not. I'm going to do these because people enjoy watching me do these. But I still want to leave that invitation open. If you want to make one of these pots, please do. And don't feel though that you have to use traditional methods or native clays and pigments or anything like that. You want to do it with commercial products, you want to fire it in an electric kiln, that's fine. Just, just attempt something similar. And then if you've done it, if you've made one that you want to share, upload it to Instagram. Use the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge on your Instagram post so that I can find it. And then at the end of the season, I'll share all of the submissions. So should be interesting. With or without participation, it should be interesting. If you'd like to see last year's challenge, where I went out on a road trip across the Southern Southwest and visited these places, very similar to this one, but Southern Southwest, a little history of pottery in the ancient Southern Southwest, I'm going to link that video up right over here. So go check that out. Learn a little bit about the other side of the Southwest. I appreciate you coming with me today. I'll catch you next time.